I'd heard of ESG, looked at it a little bit, heard of triple bottom line accounting. And I thought, yeah. I have to go and learn more about this. So if you talk about me being a climate quitter, that's probably the moment where I made that conscious decision and I'm going to spend the rest of my working life. Welcome back, everybody. Rich Bigger, founder of Collector Responsibility, here today with another episode of the Sustainable Ambassador Podcast. Today, I'm joined by the amazing Sam Crispin, Regional Head of Sustainability ESG at Savills. Through this conversation, we're going to talk about his journey as a climate quitter, his recent decision to move away from pure real estate and the advisory work that he had been doing into the ESG function within the same industry. Sam, thank you very much for taking the time. It's really great to have you here to talk about the work that you're doing and also the the, the path that you're on. Yeah, thanks, Rich. Um, I wouldn't describe myself as a climate quitter. I would say that sustainability is something I've always done my best to do, and it hasn't always had such a high profile as it has today. So uh, what I'm doing now is really an extension of part of what I've always tried to do, but with a particular focus now on what we now describe as ESG. Why make a full jump, I guess, into ESG (laughs) role then? And what was the decision process for leaving kind of the traditional role into a very specific ESG role? Uh, That was probably... uh by accident rather than by design. I left the company I was working for um, on the uh, city development advisory um, perspective, finished my studies, and then found a new job, which is what I do today. What was the work that you were doing before this? Like the the, the more traditional work, what, what was the first kind of 20, 25 years of your experience in the real estate industry? So I started off in Shanghai in 1994, working with the first wave of foreign property developers coming into into Shanghai and other parts of China. So I, um, and working with those developers to decide what they should be building. What was the business plan between that behind their real estate investment? And so back then, I mean, how much was environmental? How much was social? How much was governance? as part of those real estate decisions? There, there are always things like green ratio. So every every site, the part of the urban planning process have a green ratio. So mm-hmm. there has to be a certain element of greening. You know, I got involved in things like uh, public parks. Mm-hmm. Um, so public parks, you need water for irrigation. So of course you need access to uh, a source of gray water. So there's always been that kind of element and, and it's now become more much more of a focus under the ESG framework. So that's a that's a great framework for considering these things in a more pragmatic um, yeah. and scientific manner. You know, what, what's the role of buildings and cities in terms of, you know, driving or being a part of the sustainability challenge that we face? Okay, so so for the built environment, which is which is my business, mm-hmm. um, 40% of global carbon emissions are derived from Um, the built environment. Mm. Here in Hong Kong, 90% of energy consumption is building related. So there is that that deep imperative to to fix (laughs) to fix cities and buildings and and make them make them work. It's happening fastest in new construction. Mm -hmm. um, But the majority of buildings that will still be in use in 2050 uh, already exist. Mm -hmm. Um, They need to have go through a retrofitting process. And that could involve big challenges and small challenges. Well, it's actually, I mean, that's actually what drew me into sustainability to begin with. I was traveling all over China and I'm watching these cities being built. I'm like, how the hell is this going to happen, right? Like, I, I wasn't even thinking about carbon at the time. I was really just looking at materials and people and, you know, just bringing all these people, like, like, how is this going to work? And so for me, it was very much about solving real kind of supply chain meets society meets economic issues. So then what does a regional head of sustainability and ESG do at Savills? Like, what are the activities that you're engaged with? What are the key issues that you folk that you're focused on and can you be a rabid environmentalist in this role or do you have to be a, a practical operator at the same time uh, my primary role is being a diplomat trying to build a consensus within a quite a diverse organization so i i have a blended role so what do i do um i work with uh, on the esg reporting for savills um in asia so working with all our offices around the region um, people are at different stages of their knowledge and understanding of what the issues are and what it really means. I try to focus on on some fairly specific um, issues on a step by step basis. We can't we can't uh, bring about change within twelve or eighteen months. We're looking at a five to eight year period. But putting the S into ESG and, and activating that is uh, is a particular challenge this year. And beyond that, I go out to the market and I try and help businesses that occupy or build or manage real estate understand where they are or what they could be doing, um, pick out some easy wins, 
there's a whole variety of businesses that are that are taking action so the, so that's been very reassuring so when um, you stepped into this esg role how much of the work did you already know coming from the industry and were there specific issues or areas that you realized you had a gap in and needed to to spend some time on yeah so i'm i'm not i'm not the technological guy i i don't i went look at air conditioning systems and 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 try and fix those but we have we have people that do that so i might be the person that says you need to look at your air conditioning system the next time it's up for up for maintenance um and then we can bring in the engineers to help resolve any issues or, or see whether it needs replacing mm. what is the what is the cost going to be um what is the benefit going to be in terms of uh, energy savings yeah. um, and then try and put that business plan together with your sustainability ambition how much of your previous work allows you to do that more easily than had you just been say a, a, a traditional you know environmental sustainability professional coming into the new sector I, I get the question about if we want to make our brown building green what's the benefit going to be in uh, in rental and that, and that's incredibly difficult to uh, to determine mm -hmm. um, but at least we can make some assumptions and come up with a credible evidence backed um, idea that goes into the into the model so i'm applying existing knowledge adding the newly gained knowledge and using yep. the same process um, to go through what I do in terms of, of a deliverable, whether that's internally to Savills or externally to uh, to clients. So as a sustainability professional now in, the, in that sector, is it is it more important to have the overarching understanding? Uh, I, I'm somebody that always needs to get the kind of helicopter vision before I can before I can start drilling down into the detail. That's just that's just the way my mm. my mind works. So I, I spend a lot of time trying to trying to get that oversight and overview mm -hmm. then i can bring in the related experts specialists um, to focus on those those more specific areas and where do you go to learn are you going to industry conferences are you getting certifications are you going to school like where where are you getting your information to learn more about what's happening in the space or just the tools that you might you know need a little bit sharpening of there's a wealth of information out there i join a few uh, free online courses um, okay. those those can be quite insightful um so one of my favorites um is uh is future learn uh, mm -hmm. which comes out of the open university in the uk they have a lot of free online courses and they're not they're not all that they're not all that deep and meaningful but they highlight the specific topics because i think like the ongoing education in this space it's a really important piece of this yeah. and so i'm yeah. curious when you were looking at this program were you specifically looking for a corporate governance were you just finding something that looked interesting locally what what was your process for figuring out you know which course yeah. or which degree you're going to take yeah you know rich i when i when i i think it was a fairly subconscious process but let, let me take you back to when i was uh, if you don't mind for a minute when i was 21 year old undergraduate mm. um and i was writing my bachelor's degree dissertation mm. the title for that was let me think about it the uh, environmental and social cost benefit analysis of the three gorges dam the three gorges dam is is the world's biggest hydropower project yeah um it was approved for construction i think in 1990 1992 which was mm -hmm. the year that i was doing my dissertation social environmental um but the conclusion was that the governance or the government or the 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 process of uh, of approval was actually a political decision more than any of the topics that I discussed in my dissertation. So, so when I came across this program, I thought back to my dissertation and thought, okay, this is this 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 works. This is there's a connection here. And I'd I'd heard of ESG. I'd looked at it a little bit. I'd heard of triple bottom line accounting, um, and that was sort of backfilled um, to all the time. Um, between my bachelor's degree and starting this new course, I thought yeah. I have to I have to go and study this. I have to go and learn more about this. There was uh, definitely a calling. So if you talk about me being a climate quitter, that that was probably the moment um, where I made that conscious decision mm. that I'm going to go and do this course, and I'm going to spend the rest of my working life trying to promote solutions to to sustainability. What was it about that moment that made you say, hey, this, this is now the time to, to make a full shift and to spend my next 25, 30, 50 years of work working on this sector? I, I think it was a realization this, this is something I'd been interested in when I was 21 and what I decided as my topic for my 
uh, bachelor's dissertation, and mm -hmm. then the connection that now now's the time to to go back to that and, and build on build on that okay. and, and learn some new skill sets. Um, how do I extend my career? You know, when you're when you're in your fifties, mm -hmm. um, it's not easy to make to make those career changes unless you acquire a compelling new skill that that people want. And it's not it's not it's not about it's not about money. It's nice to have an income, and income is uh, is important. Yeah. Um, but that, that's certainly not the motivating factor. The motivating factor is doing everything that I can to uh, to to help this business transition that uh, has to be made. And so is that your vision? No, I'm I'm going to be the guy that uh, educates the cynics and tries to help people mm. an idea of yes, we can achieve this, 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 and this. This is how we do it. This is what needs to happen. It's not difficult. It's really not complicated. Yeah. Um, but it needs every single person or eighty percent of people need to get on board, make a decision that they're going to make changes. Angling that a little bit differently from a professional standpoint, though, is this is this the greatest time, the greatest place to be in terms of these conversations? I, I think it's I think it's perhaps a little bit early, as I as I found in uh, in the mid nineties. There was a little bit early, a little bit early there. But you okay. know, you've got, you've got the chance to. Embed yourself, get your knowledge, work out your business models, um, come up with solutions a short period of time before before things really start to happen. Mm. Um, and we're seeing it in in parts of the region. We have uh, different policy frameworks in different different countries around around Asia. So it's starting to happen, and the okay. rest will be following very very quickly. If you were talking to someone who's also mid career and looking at the next phase being more sustainably oriented or completely in sustainability. What are a few tips you'd give them for trying to figure out what their next step should be? Uh, the sustainability field is wide open. Um, yeah. Just find something you have a particular interest on, builds on as much of your existing knowledge and experience, um, and just pick an area of focus and become the go-to person for that. I'm going to go back to your personal transition. Talk to me about when you made the decision to launch your next phase. Where were you? And then what were the steps you took to launch this next phase into sustainability? After 20, 25 years doing generally fairly similar things at, at increasing levels of seniority, mm -hmm. but I found I was stagnating. I wasn't coming up with fresh ideas. I wasn't coming up with fresh thinking. Mm. Um, so that, that's something that, uh, that occurred to me and, and that uh, going back to study full-time for a year could could help me with so when you're looking at the hku degree one were you only focused on say hong kong based opportunities or did you kind of scan the globe for the best schools and the best programs and and kind of evaluate or were you really clear when you got started that you want to go to this one program because you knew of it already i was i was absolutely very focused on hong kong university i was working in hong kong at the time so i wanted to stay local uh they offered the uh, part-time part-time program and I didn't know that much about sustainability programs elsewhere. Uh, there, there are good online courses, and uh, that that those online courses are probably the way to go for people wanting to make a career transition without giving up their full time job. And did you seek out other things like, say, Gresby or Lead or any of these other certifications, or were you kind of beyond that in terms of your own career need, but you know maybe interesting going forward? Uh, I, I do. Uh, I, I did a, the GRI course, so the Global Reporting Initiative. So I was. I'm really fascinated by the whole ESG reporting process mm. uh, and how you go from a lot of quanti qualitative issues to quantitative reporting. So when I after I finished my master's course, I did the GRI program. And I suppose the problem with those is that there's no end of qualifications that, that are needed. Yeah. If you if you end up with uh, Taking a beam plus, you end up with a client that wants lead or, or something else, and they are interchangeable. They're very they're very similar. Would those be required for someone of your experience to be successful in the ESG role, or is that something that you feel like definite for the middle management? I see a lot of middle management, a lot of young people getting it, but I'm not sure in the senior executive role. I mean, it's a nice to have, I'm sure, but is it a requirement of the job, or is it something that you know, you just you they're get away building with it. Blocks. They're building blocks. They're building mm -hmm. blocks, and and they're they're not that difficult to do. Um, but I, I agree, you can end up doing too many of, of those things, and at, at a senior level, you don't you don't need them. You just have to have an understanding of what they are and what they mean, what mm -hmm. they're what they do, what they don't do, right. um, and try try and pull the whole the whole piece piece together. So, <laughs> I've I've spent a bit of time um, acquiring knowledge about about Gresb. Mm. And uh, 
uh, a couple of clients I've met recently say it doesn't go deep enough. It doesn't focus enough on on energy, for example. Right, right. Um, so <laughs> they all they all they're all part of a matrix of uh, yeah. of solutions. So even if and, you don't have them, you still need to understand them enough to have a conversation like that with peers, clients, stakeholders. Yeah, I mean, one of, one of the things I've learned is that there are 600 different green building certifications worldwide. So Japan has their own one, which focuses on earthquake resilience. California State has one, which focuses on, on water conservation. The uh, latest Australian one has uh, fossil fuel free buildings as, as a standard for the highest <clears throat> six star rating. Um, so they're all different, but they're all Broadly, broadly, broadly similar in many ways. Yeah. So if you were talking to students right now, what what are two or three pieces of career advice you'd give them to get further in this space? What are the things that they should be doing now to be a, a sustainability professional in the real estate sector? Make sure you have that technology specialization um, yeah. somewhere within your within your education. Um, you can overlay the, uh, the the things I've described earlier um, at a later stage. Um, yeah. So that, that's that's the number one advice, and go out and get some practical um, experience, either through volunteering or mm. internships, and and prepare be prepared to document what you've done um, mm. over over that process. Um, there's many opportunities out there, um, so make the most of them. Would you recommend someone follows a path of pure sustainability as a start, or get into the industry that you want to change and make 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 a transition like you did later on in your career once you're more established and you have that those resources? Well, perhaps I can uh, I can mention my son who's uh, going through the university application process at the moment, course selections, um, and uh, I encourage him to look at uh, fuels of the future as a as a career path. Um, so he went through that thinking process. I guided him. Um, and the conclusion we came to together was to focus on the science first and then pick up the business capability at a later stage.